Now good morning again, or should I say good evening and welcome to the second lecture in Geopolitical Risk. Uh, today we'll, or I rather, will talk about black swans and geopolitical forecast. And I will not talk about this black swan directly, this particular black swan, which um, was originally discovered by Europeans in uh, Australia back in 16, the 1690s, I think. Uh, but I'll speak about a peculiar kind of uh, phenomenon that we colloquially uh, refer to as, as black swans. And I'll also deal with geopolitical forecasts. Um, by way of or prediction, geopolitical forecast or prediction by way of walking you through uh, a specific report written by a company called Eurasia Group, uh, which specializes in, in uh, geopolitical risk analysis. And that report is doubly important, not only because it's, uh, it's an interesting read in itself, but it also provides a blueprint for your term paper. And I'll devote a few minutes to, to those papers as well, because it's, it's based on, uh, on a Eurasia Group report. So you'll get a special, and many of you know this already from reading the course outline or course description, but your job is to write something similar. So I'll basically do two things. Firstly, <clears throat> the political risk uh, analysis or forecasting industry represented mostly by, by Eurasia Group. And secondly, uh, I'll speak about a couple of articles on the readings uh, which focus on the black swan phenomenon. Um, one by Robert Jervis and another by Taleb and, and Blith. Um, but first, let's just, let me just say a few words about the analysis or prediction business or forecasting business. Because some of you might end up in this business or in related areas related companies or agencies uh, doing political analysis and essentially often political predictions. Uh, what will likely happen in the future and how might that impact my business or, or, or you know, a government agency or the national economy. It's all part of the same sort of, of uh, area. So there's a lot of jobs and many of you will end up in such uh, jobs and many former students have ended up in such jobs. In this course, we speak mostly about those political and geopolitical developments and events that impact on international businesses. Uh, and that's represented, for instance, by Eurasia Group, which is um, one prominent representative of that kind of business. They analyze and predict political developments and they tell their clients how will this likely, this development, how will, will this likely impact your business. So most of their clients are businesses, not all of, of their clients. And you have other such firms. Control Risk Group is another. The Economist Intelligence Unit uh, also provides such forecasts and, and sell them to clients. Uh, and they hire a lot of political scientists, sometimes also economists, sometimes also historians. PRS Group is a fourth uh, one. And you have really a jungle of political risk analysis companies out there. Many are based in London or in New York, and these are, um, you know, business hubs and financial uh, centers. So it's natural that many of these are, uh, are based there. Often they look for talented people, well-educated people uh, with an understanding of politics, but also often an understanding of particular areas, area experts people with language skills or experience from living in, you, you know, various countries. Uh, if you know um, Arabic or you know Spanish or you know French or, or um, 
any other language. Um, and in particular, if you also have some experience traveling or living in, in these places, they, they, and also coupled with relevant education, political understanding, economic understanding, uh, then you're, you're well suited for applying for jobs in, in, that, uh, in that particular industry. Stratfor, <clears throat> another company, deals with um, geopolitical forecasting. Um, and then we have a Norwegian uh, example, um, a company based in Bergen, <clears throat> which specialize in particular in maritime risk analysis. You know, the risk of attacks out at sea, because uh, pirate attacks have become huge issue in various places uh, around the world and these guys in Bergen they they uh, their business really started taking off during those years where the piracy problem in the Red Sea uh, with these Somali based pirates the piracy problems in the Red Sea really really grew uh, and what also grew was the demand from ship owners, from from um, you know businesses <clears throat> that that uh, were attacked or were afraid of being attacked uh, by these pirates. In later years, that problem in you know the Gulf of Aden and and the Red Sea uh, and by Somalia, that problem has lessened. Uh, for various reasons, risk management reasons. Many of the vessels are, are now armed. That's one reason. Perhaps the most important reason is that these big countries, including the US and including European countries, including China also, they have sent their military vessels there to, to protect businesses because it's a costly uh, thing. But the point here is that these people in, in Bergen, they started um, in a joint venture, actually, with a subsidiary of, of Boeing, this large American company. And, and uh, the people in Bergen, they give input to, to this, you know, these maps, which kind of helps the vessels navigate and helps them um, being warned about the possibility, the likelihood of uh, piracy attacks. So some of these firms specialize in uh, smaller areas like maritime attacks. Others are more all-encompassing, like uh, Eurasia Group and, and many other. Eurasia Group, for instance, they have offices spread around the world, uh, a lot of area experts uh, in their staff. And, and, um, and then you have other consultancies, research institutes, predicting political developments, not necessarily to help particular businesses, um, but they also often have clients that can be government departments that can be, you know, everyone who is willing to pay. Um, and of course, uh, university professors, they also often deal with sometimes at least with, uh, prediction and certainly with research that can help, um, either themselves or others to, to forecast the future. Even if forecasting is extremely difficult, something that, that uh, Equinor, the Norwegian oil company, experienced a few years ago, which we'll, we'll get back to next lecture, um, I believe. Uh, because Equinor a few years ago experienced a, a horrible terrorist attack in Algeria, which they, and they've tried to learn their lesson from that uh, attack. And now Equinor has a much uh, more focus on geopolitical risk forecasting. They used to have a, a um, sort of a, a political risk group within that company that did uh, various forecasting, but now, now they have beefed that up. Uh, and I'll get back to, to that. And a lot of these big companies and sometimes medium-sized companies, they have uh, their own uh, internal departments dealing with political issues. Uh, smaller companies cannot really afford that because they have to specialize in, in um, their core activities 
Equinor is so, so large and they do have investments spread around the world in many really difficult places and, and which they have discovered several times and, and uh, um, for them it's really useful to have a, a core staff that is internal to the company. But Equinor, along with a lot of other multinational companies, they also buy services from these um, firms specializing in political risk analysis. And then, of course, uh, if we talk about career opportunities, which uh, is always interesting, I guess, for students to, to um, learn about and to discuss, the Norwegian government has a lot of agencies dealing with the same basic stuff, you know, prediction, forecasting, explanations, risk analysis, um, the foreign service, and, and you have something called LAN Info, the country analysis um, agency, which, which really uh, analyzes developments in virtually every country in the world, trying to keep um, uh, updating information, where you can travel, how safe it is, etc. And then, of course, you have the intelligence services of different countries, the spies spy services, which we uh, often call them, they, they're not only spies, um, it's all also about analysis. So if James Bond is, um, if he is, is to be effective in his job, he needs, you know, a core team of analysts. And we have that in Norway, you have the military intelligence services, you have the internal, the PST, uh, we have the famous CIA, this big, and the Americans have a gigantic um, intelligence service, or many intel intelligence services. And the CIA is, is the most famous. They do analysis. They do spying as well, but they also do analysis. MI6 in, in um, uh, James Bond's uh, service in based in, in London is the same thing. Big service, many thousands of, of employees. The French one, DGSE, which is famous from that uh, recent series, Le Bureau, they do the, do the same thing. Spying and analysis, and it's forecasting. Much of their job is forecasting, but not for business clients. Even though business clients can get access to some of this, <clears throat> Uh, this reportion and, and analysis, but mostly their clients is, you know, the government. Um, and then you have the Israeli, the Mossad, which is also famous and, and extremely competent in many of the things they do. And then lastly, you have uh, a written <coughs> MIGA and OPIC, which are two big insurers of geopolitical risk or political risk in, in general. Um, so they and ins insurers need information and they need information that says something about the likelihood of certain events happening. What is the likelihood of, you know, a civil war breaking out in this or that country? Uh, they make um, insurers make money, of course, out of of um, out of their business clients based on you know as accurate as predictions as possible. That is extremely difficult in the political sphere, and we'll get back to that when we discuss the black swan uh, problem. Um, but even if it's difficult. If you have good analysis, um, you know, you might, that might help your business uh, enormously. So these political risk insurers, they actually aid uh, multinational companies, businesses that want to establish some activities, some businesses in difficult places. And without these insurers, it would be too risky for, for many of these firms. So that's the business, the general business of political risk analysis in a broad sense. Um, but in the beginning now, 
uh, it's about Eurasia group. And they publish each and every year they publish and have existed, I don't know, for, for a couple of decades, uh, at least 20, 25 years, um, is my guess. Um, Eurasia Group publishes each year a report. They do a lot of different things and they help their clients and they deal with, you know, geopolitical analysis. But they have this fancy report coming out each January, which uh, which is an easy read and it's uh, it's always nice and, and uh, easy on the eye to to um, to read those lists the top risks that they um, foresee for 2020 so last or this uh, January they came up with this year's list and uh, I'll go through some of these points um, but then they added, for the first time, they added uh, a couple of months later or three months later, they added a new version of that um, of that list, the coronavirus edition. Uh, and they tried to tell the reader that, you know, we made this list of 10 prominent risks, which will become a huge thing, we think. Uh, in 2020, but then the coronavirus situation happened and then they asked the question, how does the coronavirus thing or developments interact with these uh, geopolitical risks? So you really have two reports to, to read, but the first one, the basic one is, is um, what I'll, you know, spend time on now and I'll perhaps say a couple of words about the interaction effect because the coronavirus has impacted businesses a lot it has in, impacted politics a lot it has strengthened some of the risks made them more severe uh, other risks have actually been alleviated because of the coronavirus um, and i'll get back to to that in general the Eurasia group argues that, and I agree with, with that assessment, that in recent years, and that can be, you know, five years, ten years, uh, and it's more clear now than five years ago. In recent years, uh, we've seen a reversal of some, let's call them positive trends, at least positive from the perspective of most international businesses. Globalization has increased, the interaction, uh, the selling of stuff, the importing, exporting of stuff, investments across borders, uh, kind of frictionless investments and, and trade. Um, multinational companies have lived, and I, I talked a bit about that uh, during the first lecture, multinational companies have had an environment that has been positive in particular since the end of the Cold War. And it has become more and more positive in many ways. Um, so the globalization phenomenon, the interaction between different parts of the world, businesses in different parts uh, of the world, uh, the rules of the game has been stable, you know, in terms of tariff levels, in terms of monetary policy, in terms of many of these things that can um, constrain the activities of businesses. And the geopolitical cycle, to call it, uh, that has been positive. And, and Eurasia Group argues it's been positive since the Second World War. It was extremely negative for a long, uh, for a long time. And then you had the Cold War and you had some ups and downs and you really had two separate uh, worlds in our world, to, to put it like that, the Western world or the US-shaped uh, or Western-shaped uh, world, you, you've had relative stability for long periods of time. And in particular, since the end of the Cold War, where this other world, the Soviet-shaped uh, world and, and the communist world, it disappeared. You've had more of a coherent uh, development of relative stability in most parts of the world, and certainly in, in 
those parts that are economically uh, most important. So we had these two trends that are uh, really, these two phenomena and trends that are really uh, partly dependent upon each other and, and, and uh, they co-vary to, to a large degree, geopolitical cycles and globalization. Um, and then you had some ups and downs in economic cycles, but, but that's, um, it largely follows the globalization trend according to, to this uh, company. But now you've had a dip and you've had a dip for a few years worst geopolitical trends from the perspective of international business, from the perspective of many others as well. More conflict, more rivalry, uh, more instability in important parts of, of economically important parts of, of the world. You've had more opposition to globalization. That's another thing. Without any reversal, but we see the signs now that, that at least the part reversal is uh, probably on the cards. And this is also a, an area where the coronavirus enters, because that has a major impact on, you know, the, on trade and on, on, um, on travel, on interaction. Um, so the coronavirus will probably depending upon how long that, that situation lasts, it will probably help strengthen some of these trends in a negative way or negative scene, again, from the perspective of stability and international businesses. Um, so, um, let's get to these 10 points and I'll, I'll speak briefly about some of them uh, and this again is from Eurasia Group it says 2019 here it's not 2019 um, I'll give you the 2020 list and it's in this report top risk 2020 and I'll just briefly state that the first risk they uh, highlight is about the election in the U.S. Uh, and of course elections in the U.S. is normally or always very important, presidential elections. Also elections to Congress, but presidential elections is, is really the top thing. But normally the elections are not you know, the U.S. is the most important country on many levels and in terms of many different impacts, including impacts on international businesses. The U.S. is the most important country in that respect and has been for a very, very long time. Uh, but the thing is that this election is not really... Um, is not really at some levels, not really that similar to earlier elections. Because earlier elections in the US, and the US has strong institutions, many things, you know, we expect them to, to proceed as they did before. Uh, we expect no change, no major change. And this election is different. And, and, uh, and that has to do partly, you know, with the, with the polarization in the political landscape in, in the U.S. and in society to, to a large extent. And it concerns also the warning signs when it comes to the acceptance of the election result, the legitimacy of the U.S. Uh, presidential election is under, you know, it's, it's a question. What will happen if it's a close run? What will happen, you know, if people can vote on the internet or not vote on the internet via mail, um, ordinary mail, or not via ordinary mail? Uh, will Donald Trump accept the uh, election result if he loses? Will the other side, the Democrats, accept it if, if he wins? What about Russian interference, Chinese interference? 
external interference uh, in more broadly. So the run-up to this election will create probably, according to Eurasia, a lot of, you know, turbulence. Even if, you know, basically things usually, um, you know, proceed as always, almost. You had a really contested election back in 2000, uh, which was hotly debated, controversial, but, but the loser of that election, the losing party, accepted that. They accepted that the institutions of the United States, uh, notably the Supreme Court, would, you know, this ultimately decide who won this election. Um, and the legitimacy of these institutions in the eyes of the president, the current president, and in the eyes of many others is, is questioned. So that's a thing to watch out for. And then we have the second thing, which has to do more directly. The first risk is, is at base level, the, it's about domestic politics and institutions in America. But it has always spillover effects when it comes to international actors, other states, businesses, the international economy, um, and instable and inst instability in the U. Uh, controversy in the U.S., uh, wrangling uh, and, and, and polarization in the U.S. has some specific effects um, on how others perceive this country, which is economically the most important country in the world still. Economic stability, which often is based on you know, political stability, economic stability in the U.S. is central to the stability of the world economy. So that's, you know, a domestic risk, uh, U.S. domestic risk, which has some serious international uh, implications. The other risk is more, you know, traditional geopolitics. Uh, even if it's not really traditional in the sense that we have seen the exact same thing before. But what we're witnessing now is, Eurasia Group calls it the great decoupling. We don't know yet if it's a great decoupling. It's in, in, um, we're in the process where this decoupling has begun and is accelerated. And that has to do with um, with rivalry, essentially with rivalry between the chi between China and the U.S. and and the U.S. in particular is staking out a strategy where they perceive that the commanding heights of the future economy, commanding heights of the future economy, is about high tech stuff, and that country which controls and dominates high-tech sectors. Uh, that country will be in an excellent position to dominate or to be number one, to be the most important country uh, in the years and decades ahead. That country which does not command the most important and high-tech sectors of the economy will not be number one. And that's, you know, part of, of what's going on when the U.S. is treating Chinese high-tech companies really harshly right now. It's not only about, you know, official accounts that, that you know, they're, they're state-sponsored and, 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 and some such things. Um, it's about a relative, you know, common fear, if you look throughout history, that, that um, you know, this other country is rising and it's becoming far better year by year in this, these important, really important economic sectors. So we've gotten used to a, you know, international economic sphere where Companies have this complex supply chain. Chinese companies can buy their, you know, input from, can buy 
things that that they need for their value chain, they can buy that from American companies or other companies. So these high tech products like mobile phone and and uh, other stuff is made up of, up of different parts sourced from different parts of the world. Chinese companies use you know their their not only their customers but their suppliers are American companies and vice versa. American companies draw from you know Chinese sources to get and and the bottom of this thinking, the bottom line of this thinking is that um, it's more efficient uh, to let the marketplace, you know, help our company, which also effectively helps, you know, the whole national economy and the world economy, um, a division of, of labor. And that is what is changing now in some sectors some sensitive sectors and high-tech sectors uh, computing mobile phones 5g networks um, artificial intelligence you will see likely according to eurasia and and uh, i agree with that assessment you will likely see now in the months and years ahead a gradual or perhaps a more dramatic decoupling where Chinese companies in these sectors do not do trade with American companies. And the Chinese state will likely, and they have already started, you know, on a strategy where they will become independent as much as possible on other countries, suppliers in other countries. And that, of course, has some serious uh, ramifications when it comes to what businesses can do or can't do. They have to reorganize, uh, they have to rethink, they have to reanalyze the geopolitical uh, landscape. So they refer to, to President Xi Jinping of, of China, that, uh, who has called for a new long march to break China's technological dependence on the US. Um, so, but this risk, which is quite visible from very recent examples, because this is a you know, day-to-day uh, thing, in particular the pressure the US uh, puts on China and Chinese companies, uh, which make it halfway impossible now for Chinese high-tech companies in these sensitive sectors uh, to enter the US markets. Um, it's too risky. Then we have the third and very related top risk. Um, and I agree with the uh, emphasis on the China-US uh, relationship because three of these, all three of these risks have to do top risks of the list of the 10 top. Uh, the three are the most important according to Eurasia's assessment. All three has to do with the U.S. So you have the U.S. election, you have the great decoupling uh, high-tech uh, sectors, and thirdly, you have the more general relationship between the U.S. and China. And the U.S. is in all of these three risks, China is in, in two of them, and it's natural because the U.S. is the most powerful, mo most weighty country when it comes to international politics, when it comes to international business. China is the second most important and weighty country when it comes to international politics more broadly and when it comes to international business. The third risk has to do with the general US-China relationship. As they say, uh, Eurasia Group, as this decoupling occurs, US-China tensions will lead to more explicit clash over national security, influence and values. The two sides will continue to use economic tools in this struggle, sanctions, export controls and boycotts, with shorter fuses and goals that are more explicitly political. Companies and other governments will find it harder to avoid being caught in the crossfire. And that's also something we have seen clearly for the last year or two years. Um, it's and it's particularly a U.S. shift. China has, in a sense, grown and grown economically, militarily, 
and they have used this growth to be more assertive in certain questions, both domestically um, and externally vis-a-vis -vis other countries. Uh, and you have so many flashpoints which the U.S. has started reacting to, not only trade issues. We had a famous trade war, you know, trade discussions, and you have a partial agreement, and it's, um, but it's, it's really not something that has been sold or is likely to be sold. And, you know, the tariffs and trade balance uh, conflict. Uh, so you ha and you have the high tech, the decoupling things, which we've talked about. And recently, of course, you have a host of other issues uh, that in totality brings the US-China relationship to a level that is not too far away from what we can can deem a, a, a cold war. You have rivalry on some, so many issues. You have the high-tech rivalry, the trade rivalry, you have territorial rivalries, uh, or rather you have what the U.S. deemed to be Chinese expansions into the South China Sea, into the East China Sea. Uh, I can try to use the map here. China in this area is expanding, building islands or, or, or um, making very small islands bigger, moving their military there, building air uh, runways for, for military aircraft, moving um, anti-aircraft missiles there. They're expanding because they want to control the South China Sea and they also want to control the East China Sea here. Uh, where Japan has, until now, uh, a certain degree of territorial control. These are two of the territorial uh, issues. The third one we recently saw in, uh, in um, the southwestern part of, of China, where you had this border, uh, border skirmish vis-a-vis uh, -vis India, where some 20 Indian soldiers were killed in quite a dramatic uh, incidents high up in the mountains, the Himalayas. Um, so you have these territorial issues, but then you, of course you have the domestic issues and we've gotten used for last year, you know, to the Hong Kong uh, issue, the demonstrations, the attempts of the Chinese government to, to be a little more or, or more assertive vis-a-vis -vis Hong Kong, which has really functioned as its own economy. That was part of the setup when the British uh, gave back, so to speak, Hong Kong to China in 1997. Hong Kong then served or, or had a role, played a role of a separate economy, a hub for international companies, where they can, could draw on a more stable and, you know, Western-like uh, rule of law regime. Um, and, and more, you know, policies that, that they're used to and that are um, associated with less state control or no state control. So you had two separate economies. You had the Chinese and you had the Hong Kong economy. Um, but now, in the last year or so, and in particular in the last few months, that has changed quite dramatically because China has changed some laws uh, concerning what they can and can't do in, in Hong Kong. So Hong Kong has become more, you know, a part of China also when it comes to their laws and, and, and uh, also when it comes to their economy. So Hong Kong is, is far more risky now to enter into than it used to be for international businesses. But part of the reason is the reaction by the US because the US is adamant that Hong Kong should continue to be separate on many dimensions to the Chinese mainland. Um, and they're institution, instituting sanctions against certain individuals, certain entities that has to do with the treatment and, and the changes in laws and regulations vis-a-vis -vis Hong Kong. 
Um, and the U.S. is unwilling to uphold their view of Hong Kong as a separate economy, which will have major implications and has ma major implications for businesses there. And you have other areas of discontent as well. You have the treatment of Tibet, which is a, a um, uh, you know, a difficult issue for, for China. Um, there are many people who want Tibet to be uh, an independent country and, and um, who argue forcefully that China is an occupier. And then more prominently in the last year has been the situation in Xinjiang, where you have the Uyghur uh, Muslims uh, and the treatment of that in what the Americans call concentration camps, essentially. Uh, or, or, and, and the, the Americans refer to the slave labor, that some companies use labor, uh, were based in Xinjiang to, to, and they're really slave labor, making things for international companies. And in general, the U.S. says that China treats, uh, the people in Xinjiang, Xinjiang, sorry, you treat them horribly. So it's a question of values and human rights. And that is also connected to, you know, the most important issue seen from, from China's perspective, most important foreign policy issue has to do with Taiwan, which used to be Chinese and then it became Japanese in, in the late 19th century. And then you had the civil war in China and, you know, the losing uh, side, they, they ran off, the nationalists ran off to Taiwan. And then you had this de facto separation between Taiwan and the mainland. And China wants it back. China sees Taiwan as part of China. And the Americans have essentially an alliance or a security pact with Taiwan, not officially but essentially they promise Taiwan that if anything happens in terms of, of uh, Chinese intervention, invasion, um, the U.S. will come to Taiwan's aid. Um, and now the U.S. has um, increased their pressure, so to speak, on China or increased their deterrence. They're, they're upgrading their dealings with the Taiwanese political leadership. And that is angering China. The main point is that you have um, you have all these different um, points of antagonism. You have all these conflicts, conflict dimensions, which helps you know constitute a, a relationship between the U.S. Uh, between the U.S. and China, which is uh, really far worse. Uh, than it was only three, four or five years ago. Um, so, and some of these issues I mentioned are also uh, depicted here, Hong Kong, South China Sea, Taiwan, Xinjiang, and, and then the high-tech innovative sectors uh, thing. Okay, I've spent some time on, on these issues, so I'll go more quickly through through the rest. And, and um, the fourth point is about multinational companies. Um, you know, they cannot fill this governance gap, as Eurasia Group um, calls it. That is, you know, you have a less stable environment, rules of the game, you have less uh, predictability in what the big countries will do or won't do. And there's a limit to what these companies can, can on their own, um, you know, pressure or, or, or um, it's a limit to how they can shape their environment. Multinational companies, international businesses, they crave stability, clear rules of the game, capitalism, market-based rules, they crave globalization and all that. Stability. And they get sort of the opposite or more of the opposite now. But, but these forces are really out of the multinationals' control. That's one basic mes message from uh, Eurasia Group. 
And then you have more uh, internal things going on in India, nationalism, you have, uh, and when it's interacted with the coronavirus situation, you don't, you know, you get a heightened level of um, uncertainty about uh, what the future will, will bring for India. But you've had a lot of episodes in Kashmir, you've had a lot of episodes with the treatment by the Hindu nationalists of Muslims in, in general. So Eurasia Group refers to, to some of these developments. Yeah, developments in Europe, geopolitical Europe, as they call, Eurasia Group calls um, point number six, the need for Europe to, in a more uncertain world, a, more, a world with these big powers, China, US, and also Russia, acting more like traditional great powers. There's a need for Europe to find, finally, to put it like that, find this geopolitical uh, strategy or, or inclination at least. Because what Europe hasn't been since the EU really became a project, what Europe hasn't been for good and for bad is a geopolitical actor. It's an efficient, you know, in terms of, of, of uh, getting the economy, you know, efficient uh, trading and investment and, and uh, level playing field and competition. It's economically focused. Um, it used to be geopolitically focused. That was the reason, you know, in the 1950s, really the, the, uh, the basis for the creation of the European uh, project to avoid war. So, so it was, you know, at core um, deemed a, a geopolitical project. But it's, it hasn't been uh, now, and there's, you know, it's mostly about economics, but, but now Europe is, is, and they have been debating this, this for a long time, they need to do something about, um, to, to act uh, in concert to to be a geopolitical player at least at the, to a certain degree because they're pressured from uh, from outside and some say, see the uh, all the Chinese investments and economic dealings with Europe as a, a an issue a real issue a a potential problem some want more screening of of FDI foreign direct investment coming in from China. Some point to, you know, the other big country, uh, the US, and see uh, President Donald Trump using his, his, um, his bargaining chips to pressure uh, and to lambast, really, the, the Europeans. Uh, and, and there's, you know, some... Um, it might end up with, with a trade war and you had some threats and you had some instances of real trade conflicts. Uh, you've had a Russia for the last few years which have acted, you know, more assertive. They've come back and you had the, the uh, developments in Ukraine in 2014. All these things, you know, require uh, a geopolitical Europe, a Europe that acts like a geopolitical player. Because now you mostly have individual countries like France. And I said last lecture, I think, that you know, now France says, sends a warship and fighter jets to the Eastern Mediterranean because they don't like Turkey. They're in a you know, mild, or not mild, but they're in a diplomatic uh, quarrel with, with Turkey. And now it's become more serious. And it's, it's, but it's mostly about you know, France wanting to, to reflect that you know, we're France, we're at least a former great power. We have muscle, but they're acting alone, essentially. And that's part of the European story, that, that on geopolitics, uh, the interests and strategies of the different uh, states, they vary so much. So in the Libyan civil war, for instance, uh, which is not necessarily over, it's, it's, it's not over, France uh, backs you know, the one side and the other countries back another side. And that's, you know, that symbolizes some of these, these um, problems. But 
we can expect, according to Eurasia, attempts now to to use to to start to think in Europe collectively and geopolitically. Um, and now we have reached number seven. So I know many of you are are um, really interested in the politics of climate change and the climate change phenomenon, the risk of climate change. Of course, that in itself is not a political risk. Eurasia Group talk about, you know, politics and economics, and, and it's clear um, the effects of climate change on and the discussion and worries on politics and economics. And it's clear that businesses have to adapt. So it's a risk. It has been, and it's it's clearer has been clearer for for a while that that companies need, for various reasons, even though companies think about profits first, uh, they need to adapt because you have pressure from society, pressure from activist shareholders, pressure from politicians to uh, to to institute green strategies, green policies. The thing about the coronavirus, and this costs, you know, money because you have to change often your business model or, or cha do changes to your core strategy. Of course, the coronavirus situation, as the Eurasia Group says in their coronavirus edition of, of this report, the coronavirus situation, it changes this. It makes the risk of effects on businesses from climate change. I'm talking about regulations now and pressures, not about the, the climate dangers uh, themselves, uh, because these are really long term and not, not immediate for 2020. Um, but the coronavirus situation, it makes climate change a less important issue in the eyes of many, because it, the economy has taken a real hit in, in most countries. And then people and politicians um, who are elected by people or has to have some support and, and generally has to follow policies, economic policies, that is good for the country as a whole. Uh, people choose the economy and they forget about climate change for a while. This is an exaggeration, uh, exaggeration but, but climate change has dropped down on the list of priorities of many people. Um, then we have number eight, the Shia crescendo. I'll return later in the lecture series, I'm certain, when it comes to these issues in or by the Persian Gulf and in, in the greater Middle Eastern uh, region, but this year, 2020, started with some dramatic uh, events in in, um, um, in the Persian Gulf. Um, so the U.S. they effectively assassinated a a really important figure, uh, Qasem Soleimani, a general, a Iranian general, um, who was responsible for the foreign operations of of their their. Um, Revolutionary Guards Corps, and you had a tense situation. And after that, even if you know the coronavirus has dominated the views, you had a lot of you know small-scale attacks, probably supported by the Iranians on Iraq. The point of Eurasia Group is not to say that the Iran-U.S. situation, that conflict, is is a Thing that is so dramatic that we should expect a full-blown war within 2020 because that is unlikely because the, the um, preferences of and the incentives of these uh, two countries really inform us that, that they will do they will do a lot to avoid that uh, full-scale War, but you will have this small-scale thing and an increase in instability, and it will spill over to Iraq, which we have seen uh, since this report has has been uh, published. Spill over to Syria, uh, etc. A 
attacks on tankers. A week ago or so, the Iranians, they boarded a tanker in, in uh, a foreign vessel in this strait of, of um, Hormuz, this important strait. I can show you here. So you have had a lot of, of you know, risks and instability, particularly in 2019, but, but you still have that in, in this extremely important area. It's extremely important, not least because of the oil and gas, natural gas resources uh, that are found there. Okay, and then we have discontent in Latin America, which you clearly see, and, and which interacts with, in many countries, with the coronavirus situation, which countries are really not that prepared for. No country is prepared for that might have been even worse in some Latin American countries. The, the situation is worse um, in some of these. Like, like um, I don't know too much about it, so I shouldn't mention, the, mention particular countries. Uh, but I've heard about Peru and the level of infections. We've all heard about Brazil and, and uh, their president, Bolsonaro, who doesn't take this seriously, and, and you know, a lot of deaths. The point here about Eurasia Group's assessment is that you have a lot of these long-running problems uh, with economic inequality, with corruption, with, with social instability, with demonstrations, which, which uh, is not likely to die down. And in particular, in these economically difficult times, coupled with a lot of deaths from, from this pa pan pandemic. And then we have the 10th country, Turkey, which is an interesting, uh, very interesting case. And here, Eurasia Group focuses on both domestic issues, domestic developments, domestic, um, well, things that the president er Erdogan and um, the policies he, he tend to follow. but. One key thing here is also the external policies, the foreign policies of, of Turkey under President Erdogan, because this is, others refer to this as uh, what they call Neo-Ottoman, uh, you know, the old empire, the, the Turkish empire, which, which um, from the which reached its its height between, you know, the middle of the, of, of the 1400s and, and in the 18th century, before this decline began, and they, and they claimed and, and entered into to big parts of the Balkans and up to, to including an invasion and, and annexation of, of, of Hungary. So this is the old empire, which also stretched into North Africa, large parts of, of the Middle East, more general. Uh, and some refer to Erdogan's foreign policies as neo-Ottoman. Let's, you know, build an empire. That's an ex exaggeration, uh, but, but there's some, you know, truth. There's a lot of truth to the claim that Turkey, Turkey's um, geopolitical strategies and interests have expanded. They've entered into Syria, has territorial control over northern Syria. Um, they've entered into the Libyan civil war, supporting, you know, the government, uh, the UN uh, supported uh, government, government of national accord, uh, which had been fighting against this, these Eastern rebels led by Khalifa Haftar, and, and they pushed back these Eastern rebels. And the clue was really Turkish help. Um, and some of this stuff that went on there angered the the French, so that's part of the background for the French intervention, sort of, in, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Turkey enters into Iraq quite often. They've established military bases there in northern Iraq because they want to solve what they claim is a real Kurdish problem, which spills over to their Turkish, um, into the, the Turkey, uh, Turkish homeland. The point is, is that they, they're interfering in all these areas and now also in the eastern Mediterranean I can perhaps zoom in on that so you have 
Turkey here and, and, and they're doing oil and gas exploration here which is a big problem for Greece and for Cyprus and, and the EU gets involved and France is, is not happy and send their military vessel there. And it concerns, and I'll return to this uh, in the lecture series. I say this a lot, I'll return to this issue, but one of the lectures is about maritime risks. The particular issue right now as we speak concerns oil exploration vessel that Turkey is, is sailing through these waters which Greece claims. And following the First World War you had the territorial uh, you know, realignment and, and changes and to make a long story short you have Turkey proper here and then you have Greek, Greek islands here. So, so Greek, and these are arch enemies really, uh, Greece and, and Turkey. And, and then you also have a divided Cyprus. So Turkey occupies the northern part and what we normally then refer to as Cyprus is really the southern part, which, which is the internationally recognized part of, of Cyprus. Who controls then the waters here and the oil resources, natural gas resource, resources? That's really a matter of interpretation because it has to do with international law, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Seas to be more specific. But it's really, as I will get back to, it's really impossible almost, or extremely challenging to, to say, to agree, uh, based on some regulation or, or law text. It's difficult to say who is right. So then often, you know, when it's ambiguous, strength and power comes into play. Uh, so this is a game right now, a territorial, maritime territorial game, which you should perhaps try to, to keep tabs uh, on. And a few days ago, two of these ships, by the way, collided. Uh, it, it was one Turkish military vessel, one Greek. Uh, both sides downplay the situation a bit because these things can quickly escalate if, if um, we don't have cool heads on, on each side of this conflict. So that was really the story about um, Eurasia Group's report. And now before I'll take a break, I'll, I'll quickly say a few words about the course description about the term paper. And it's not too hard to conceive and to understand what you will be doing, uh, what you're supposed to do before the deadline, which is 11th of October. I've written in the course description a, and it should really suffice when it comes to understanding what you're supposed to do. I know I'll get, um, questions anyway, and and, uh, and of course I'll be happy to, to answer them, but um, I can't answer any now because I'm talking to a bloody computer screen, but, but I think as a first step you should read what's in this course uh, description. The deadline is 11th of October, I'll read some of this and, and comment on, on this. It has to be submitted by Black or through Blackboard uh, in one file, that's um, one thing. Uh, these are individual pieces of work, so that's just one formality, so you know that group works aren't, aren't accepted, so individual pieces of work, you will not receive a grade. It's pass, no pass. It's a training exercise, and I'm not in the business of seeking to throw people out if they if they do their best or close to their best and, and submit a fine or semi-fine uh, piece of analysis or three pieces of analysis, um, as long as it's an honest attempt. And if it's, you know, if there's too many things missing or too many, you know, things that we're not happy about, uh, you, you can get a second chance. If it's not really an honest attempt, if you just submit one page or two pages, you won't get a second attempt. But 
mostly most by far you know most people they they eventually pass this so so i want you to also understand that this is seen from my point of view as an exercise where i hope you enjoy the process and and uh, learn from the process and that you submit something that you're satisfied um, and that you you think about writing you know concisely and precisely and that you analyze things uh, you have to pass the term paper assignment to be eligible to take the exam so you have to have you write three short risk assessments they all must uh, be approved the deadline is the deadline and um, more substantively, you must write three papers or risk assessments in one file, though, and the length between 700 and 850 words. Uh, so it's not big, it's not huge um, things, but this is an important part of, or quite important part of, of the task to write efficiently and concisely to say what you need to say, what's important, what's, what's essential for your analysis, but to say it in few words, not a lot of background story. For instance, in the Eurasia report, when they write about US and China and their relationship, they don't write, you know, four pages about the history of these countries. Um, so concisely and, and, uh, and in a language I can understand and my French is not good enough to, to um, be able to, to read this and I have um, a um, teaching assistant who will read all of these papers and give you comments on them so she'll, she'll uh, that's really useful um, so all of you will get uh, comments whether you fail or you pass or you're, you have to take a second chance you will get uh, comments then the important stuff to which is not too difficult either you have to use as a template as as a blueprint the eurasia group's yearly review so you should imagine a scenario that is not unlikely considering the education you're currently pursuing namely that you're employed by this firm by eurasia group so you have to foresee or to to put yourself in a situation where you're hired by eurasia group and it's your task to identify and assess three major geopolitical risks, not 10, but pick three. And you can pick yourself, but they have to be, you know, kind of plausible candidates. So we don't want, you know, assessments of the likelihood of aliens landing or coming over from Jupiter and taking over uh, the world. They have to be plausible candidates for uh, inclusions. For the next year, 2020, 2021. So, so next year's report, but you can, you know, think about what will happen in October, November, December of 2020 as well. Um, so the assessment of each of these geopolitical risks represent one term paper, and these have to be major risks that are plausible candidates for inclusion in Eurasia's next yearly review. Um, though not necessarily the three top ones. If you think, you know, one is a plausible candidate for inclusion as number nine, you can, you can write about uh, that one. Um, okay, you should also keep in mind the following, do not engage in plagiarism. Um, you will not write academic texts per se. That means that, that um, there's some deviation from what from the setup of a normal standard term paper, but it has to be anyway uh, based on academic knowledge. The Eurasia Group report is full of academic knowledge. Their assessments are precise. We we sense and I see that that these people are they know what they're doing. I might not agree with every assessment, but but it's plausible. It's it's. Um, precisely understood and presented information uh, but not a lot of references and not a lot of and they have accumulated knowledge and they present that it's stylish and, and, and uh, it's a neat report but it's also 
high quality. So even if it's not a normal standard term paper, it shows whether or not you know you know what you're talking about or writing about. And this style, the Eurasia group style of writing, also resembles what you're more likely to be tasked with writing in any future job. You need in other courses to write term papers, which is really it has to be done because you learn a lot and it's so difficult and there's so many things to, to consider in, in, in a bachelor thesis and in a master's thesis. I mean, the, the job is so difficult that when you complete that job, you have certainly learned something that you can uh, apply in many, many jobs. This course is, is supposed to be a little bit different, a little, you know, new experience. Uh, and you're tasked with writing a piece of paper, a piece of text that more closely will resemble what many of you will have to do um, because your employer requires you to do that. Write short text that um, precisely and elegantly and, and um, and plausibly, convincingly, tell us something about something, about the essential of the problem you're discussing, whether or not it's China or climate change or Iranian politics or Saudi Arabian politics. Um, and Eurasia Group don't they don't do um, references. And I tried that a couple of years ago, no references, and people were really confused. And they asked all these questions. So last year I changed it back to, okay, you, you use references, but please place them in footnotes to ease, you know, the flow of reading. It's not a big deal, and, but, but uh, you can use references. Um, Okay, the length restrictions necessitate a very compact, efficient style of writing. You need to focus on the essentials. Tell us concisely and in clear terms what the risk is, what its main causes or underlying forces are, what the probable consequences of these forces are, including for international business, and whether the risks are contingent, uh, for, for example, on industry-specific factors, and if they vary between regions. Uh, so these are some of these issues you you know you're supposed or expected to tell us because Eurasia Group um, they tell us uh, those things and quite importantly whether you do that explicitly or implicitly we need to get some sort of sense of the issue whether or not you know this is a high probability high impact or low probability high impact or or high probability lesser impact you know some risks have a high probability of occurring but their impact is is not really um, you know great um, but other to take the opposite example you know we haven't seen, we've just commemorated this, you know, 75 years since uh, two nuclear bombs were dropped on, on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, respectively, in, in back in 1945, August 1945. Um, since then, we haven't had any nuclear attacks directed against people or, or fired in anger, as the saying and we can kind of state that the probability of, you know, in a certain year of there being a nuclear war is, is really, really low for several different reasons. Um, but the impact of such an attack would be horrendous. So then the question becomes, does it, is it necessary? Is it logical? Is it, is it reasonable to, to highlight such a risk as, you know, important. If it happened, we'd all be in trouble. One nuclear bomb can destroy one medium-sized city. So if you have 1,000, we can we can forget about living normal lives for, for the rest of, of our lives, really. But the probability is really small. The point is that you need to weigh these uh, things um, and say something useful about 
this relationship between probability and impact. And then if you want to, you're free to spice up the risk assessment with inclusion of relevant picture or illustrative figures. It's nice to read the Eurasia Group report because it's, it's nicely, also because it's nicely illustrated. Um, anyway, read this and, and uh, think a bit about it and read the Eurasia Group report or reports and then you're up and running and we'll get back to this issue. We'll soon have an interactive uh, session and I'll, I'll, um, I'll be happy to take questions then. Now I think I'll take a break. I've been speaking for over an hour, over an hour so I'll take a, a break and then continue with a second, slightly shorter uh, part of this lecture.